Thank you for the introduction. Um, so today I'm presenting the work um, that we've done with one of our previous master students. And I'll actually um, structure this according to the abstract that we submitted to this conference, uh, because that is our outline and that's what uh, we've done. And then share some insights about how much time we think that modeling takes and what our experiences with that. Um, so our abstract is a big bulk of text, but the first part <laughs> is to describe our case study. So the HIPSO project. Uh, the HIPSO project is a cube satellite, uh, and um, the goal for our university is to be able to deliver um, cube satellites with um, high risk payloads or research payloads. Uh, from uh, other departments uh, so that they can get data rapidly. And we also want our satellites to work together with uh, a network of drones, unmanned surface and underwater vehicles, uh, and then to collect all the data together to provide better situational awareness. Uh, so our main goals for the mission are to provide data for oceanographers and also to uh, somehow um, enable them to have on-demand uh, missions together with other assets. So what is ocean color? It's basically everything that gives the ocean color. Um, we're specifically interested in algae blooms, uh, which usually consist of phytoplankton, uh, but also um, of other uh, species. Uh, why this is interesting uh, is because Norway has a lot of coastline. A lot of our industry is uh, on the coast or in coastal waters or even in the oceans. And we know that all the activity that we do as humans affect our coastal areas. However, it is quite difficult to get data about ocean color today. Uh, because either you have to rely on the big satellites, such as the Sentinels or their Copernicus mission, uh, and they don't really cover the Norwegian coastline that often. Um, or you can do planned missions with boats. Uh, the problem there is that they're very, very expensive. You usually have to plan months in ahead, and you don't even know if you'll find any algae. And the same is for any manned mission. Um, and we're trying to develop the capabilities so that we can have unmanned missions and to have small satellite data so that we can have um, our own data collection that we can provide to the researchers. This is the picture that we've been um, showing to funders and different researchers and different international collaborators for the past I want to say six years, it's still our dream. Um, and while we have many of the um, assets that are shown in the water and above the water, uh, we haven't had a small satellite uh, segment yet. So the first satellite is HIPSO or HIPSO-1. It is a 6U satellite. This means that it's 20 by 10 by 30 centimeters. Uh, we have an in-house developed hyperspectral payload, and it will go in a um, polar sun-synchronous orbit. That means that it will mostly be in the sun, which we need to take pictures. And we're launching it January 10, <laughs> so I'm crossing fingers that everything will work then. Um, what is hyperspectral imaging? It's when you take pictures uh, using more wavelengths than you normally do, which are usually red, green, and blue. But now we want to do like with 100 different colors. This allows us to detect what we're looking at and to say if it's water or if it's grass or what kind of grass it is or what kind of trees there are. Or we can try to classify the algae. The Autonaut, which is one of the assets we want to work with, um, 
It's an autonomous surface vehicle. Uh, it's wave powered uh, and it has a solar um, panel system for the instruments. And it can actually do in situ measurements of the things that the satellite will look at. So if we combine those two data sources, we will get more information of the oceanographic phenomena that we want to see. Uh, because even though the camera might be able to take these pictures and to say something about the species, we don't know their true effect until we have all the other information that you could only get by having in situ measurements. Uh, the use case is monitoring harmful algal blooms. Um, they uh, suffocate the fish uh, and they can also make um, the water is poisonous. Uh, so in order to do this, we started our modeling from two sides. On one hand, uh, we have a, an experienced modeler or a little bit more experienced um, modeling from the top level. Um, but we also saw that we have so much history in this project that we need to um, actually do a little bit of bottom up modeling uh, to prepare for future development so that we can involve all the different assets uh, because we didn't start stop sorry we didn't start modeling when we started the first satellite we kind of started modeling the past year and a lot of the development was already done then so in our team uh, we're usually about 20 master students uh, maybe 15, and we're H PhDs and postdoc researchers. And the students, they join for the bachelor's in January or uh, in August for their master's thesis. So that means that we change our people every year. And this is a bit challenging with onboarding and offboarding, and also to figure out like if you worked on your master thesis, how do you store that relevant information for the next team? Uh, so for HIPSA 2, uh, we started uh, this year. And what is uh, challenging there is that we want to have a PDR for HIPSA 2, so a preliminary design review in uh, June 2022. And at the same time, we are commissioning HIPSA-1 in orbit, and we're gonna start operating HIPSA-1 in orbit. So the goal is to actually figure out how we can capture the operational knowledge of the HIPSA-1 design into HIPSA-2 design, and verify that this knowledge has been acted upon so that we actually learn from our mistakes or learn from the things we did well. And how can we improve the operations of HIPSA-1 and HIPSA-2? Um, so applying model-based system engineering can be one way uh, that we can help some of the knowledge sharing, both between the teams that change all the time and also between HIPSA-1 and HIPSA-2, or that's our hypothesis or goal. Uh, so we have five goals for our MBSE effort. It's to improve the knowledge management and reduce some of the onboarding time of new team members, to improve or better the traceability between requirements or scenarios and components, um, efficiently exchange data between project groups. When I say data, I also uh, think about, so maybe we have a model for the satellite and then someone has a model for um, the autonaut, the autonomous surface vehicle, is there a way we can exchange data between us so that we can build together towards the common goal? And we also want to reuse the model elements across projects. Um, many of the instruments, the scientific instruments that we have on the assets are actually the same, and they have the same code base, the same processing, and maybe we can use that when we're developing new assets or new instruments and just reuse the model elements to lower some of the design effort. And uh, then we wanted to take all of HIPSA-1 knowledge and design uh, into Capella. Uh, and um, what was interesting here is that 
the person who did it, he didn't have any previous uh, knowledge with systems engineering, uh, no knowledge with model-based systems engineering, and little knowledge of aerospace engineering. And this is unfortunately a little bit common in, at our university. We don't have a very large systems engineering program. There's a couple of courses you can take, but it's not um, a master's degree you can do or anything. So it's challenging to recruit people to do this. And many of the students' first experience with systems engineering activities and principles are through their work on the satellite. So there's a lot of thing that happens uh, quickly, and it's going to take us another five years to actually have a good master's program up and running. So someone might say, oh, you should just find the right students, but that's uh, we, we don't have that capability yet. So the system that we worked on first to model is the bootloader. Uh, why we chose the bootloader is because it covers uh, several different parts or logical systems that are in the satellite. We have hardware systems, so actually physical design. Uh, we have firmware systems that make the hardware work in the software, and software systems. Um, and as you see here, uh, we have had a co-development between uh, the hardware, firmware, and software. So when we've done software development, we've done it on a development board. And same with firmware development. And whenever we've gotten a hardware prototype, we could test the software. And either the software is faulty or the hardware is faulty. But I mean, together, we finally end up creating something. And it's a lot of co-design and concurrent work. And it's all with students. Um, the bootloader has a very specific uh, purpose. It's to, to boot the um, operating system and the uh, software. It is uh, the most important part of our intelligence on board the payload. If the bootloader doesn't work, we do not have any software. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, that's why we wanted to have several different ways of booting and to also have redundant boot images. A boot image is what is loaded the first time you give power to a device. So there is a lot of logic involved and also different sources uh, of storing this. Uh, the three colors you see here are three different types of storage areas to have redundancy. And they're also physically separated on board the satellite or within the payload. So uh, there's hopefully a, a lower risk of them all failing at the same time. This flow diagram here uh, is the um, basic uh, flow of how the bootloader works. First, it um, boots, <laughs> and that is uh, it starts looking for where it can find an image that works. And you can see there are different failure paths and success paths. And it will always make a count of how often it tries to do something so that it knows where it's supposed to go. So what's not shown here is a boot counter. And all of this information was either in documentation or in the code base. And the student who built the bootloader, he graduated several, two years ago. Um, so for this process, um, the student, he started by learning Capella. He did a tutorial, he watched webinars. Um, he then wanted to understand the software functionality uh on board the satellite and he also discussed with the software responsible to figure out which function to model um and then we decided that the bootloader because it's so critical it should be one of the first functions to model and in some ways it turned out it's one of the easier functions to understand the purpose of um, there's also an important part here for the bootloader on hipsa one 
uh, we wanted to have two um, memory cards where we lo loaded the booted Mishram. So we wouldn't only have three places we stored to be loaded, but actually four. Uh, however, uh, the hardware functionality to switch between SD cards didn't work and we didn't have time to rerun the electronics card making. Uh, so that is something that needs to be tested and verified for HIPSA 2 instead, where we have a longer timeline. After we understood the bootloader, we started modeling it. And um, the first model, there were some mistakes in the understanding of the logic and also how to use um, Capella. And there was a new review. And then for the future work, we want to use uh, also the modeling to maybe simplify code. Um, when we did this modeling, we saw that were areas where there, we could have reused code instead of rewriting it. So we could make the code way shorter. And that would also be good when you're uh, using the satellite, but because then you would use less memory. And these are things that were discovered during the modeling. Uh, the bootloader has uh, 216 lines of code. It is extremely sequential. Uh, do this, do this, increase this counter, do this, check if it works, okay, do that. So it's relatively easy to understand even if you don't have a programming background. Um, this is the, what the full model looks like. Um, as you see, there are, well, I don't know how well I can see it, but there are <laughs> different uh, functional change chains that show the different paths depending on if it works in the primary way or not. Uh, and we also use the sticky notes uh, system to explain the diagram because uh, this would help when you wanted to review it with the software people who weren't used to modeling this way. And we also kept it quite large, so it would be easy to zoom around and zoom into areas. On the left-hand side, you can see where the secondary SD card was supposed to work, and then you can see how it's not included in the functional chain uh, because it didn't work. Uh, however, we want to have it for the next satellite, so that's why it's modeled. Um, and we need to make sure that it works next time around. Uh, so basically, um, this modeling helped. And uh, some of the comments from the modeler were that could we simplify the logic? Uh, here he says, like, the backup code uses the same elements as the ordinary code. What is different? And this is because he was looking at the code uh, with fresh eyes from a non-coding background. So maybe he thought, OK, this is not needed. And we haven't had enough of that type of review in our software team also. So all of this is helping us a lot for future work. Um, and as I mentioned, the Secondary SD card did not work. How much time does it take? Uh, this round of modeling took about 25 hours, and including the time spent learning Capella, and also um, including making a new model when the first model wasn't as it should have been. So then we wanted to try again with someone else modeling and another functionality to see if we could get more data about how much time it takes um, to review the code and to learn from it. Uh, so we used this short code here you see on the left-hand side. Um, it's a very low-level command. There's no extra documentation outside of this screen you see. And what we learned that it's really difficult to model low-level commands, because if you're not a software programmer, you don't really understand what you're trying to model at all. Um, it might have been just that one person it happened with, but 
when that same person tried modeling a higher level command, it went fine. Uh, I don't have that data here because we're still processing it. But it shows like for, for one of our lear lessons learned from this is that when we want to model things and we want to introduce students to the modeling language and also how to read the code, uh, we should start with something that is relatively understandable or physical at a higher level so that the student has something that it can relate to the functionality to. When it's at the low level of sending CSP packets between services within um, an operating system, it gets rather hard for someone who doesn't do software programming at all. Which is why we saw that modeling the bootloader, which is more physical, uh, it has actual different physical entities um, that was easier for the student. Um, many uh, academic CubeSat teams are limited in systems engineering resources and experience. Uh, we cannot always choose or control who joins the project at any time or who leaves the project. Uh, so this was a way to look into how we could do the system engineering activities and specifically the model-based systems engineering activities without a large overhead. And Capella was chosen because it's open source and has a very large online community, which facilitates learning. And we also see that we can collaborate on the model through Git, which we use for our software system. Uh, one, another challenge that we've seen is how to train the other engineers in model-based systems engineering in addition to their discipline so that they can contribute to whomever is trying to model so they know how to communicate together to model our system. So a way forward uh, is to model the HIPSA2 from top down and bottom up. Uh, with uh, resources we haven't identified yet. And we want to use this for identifying functions that we haven't implemented, uh, but that we know we need according to our mission requirements and mission scenarios so that we can provide these issues in GitHub for the students when they're working on their thesis. We also want to use the modeling to do more dependability analysis and also incorporate verification and validation. And we, I was very happy with the previous um, uh, presentation showing, showing the Jupyter notebook and how that could be used to interface with a Capella model, uh, because I think that could make it a lot easier, especially when working with um, some of the software students who are more used to Python than anything else. And maybe we could actually uh, do faster modeling of our software functions uh, through that. With that, I'd like to thank you um, for listening today and um, crossing my fingers for a launch that is successful in two months. Um, the first question, or maybe a comment from uh, Juan Navas. Uh, have you considered using description fields in the model element plus title blocks for documenting the diagrams for review? Uh, in this way, you you would have uh, the information inside the model and not just in the sticky notes. Uh, yes, uh, we have considered it, but we didn't discover that functionality until after we did the modeling effort. I think I saw that in the newest release or some of the videos that came up this fall. This work was concluded in May, and I'm not sure if uh, that functionality was there or if the student was aware of it. Yeah. But it's a very uh, good idea. <laughs> sure, like many of one's idea. <laughs> um, even if your short, so oh, sorry, uh, even if your short source code was probably not object oriented, uh, have you considered to have a proper software model for it? 
for instance, using UML diagrams? Um, yes and no. Um, we tried doing that in the beginning of the project. Um, however, uh, we find it very challenging to uh, encourage students to document things in other ways than are absolutely necessary for their thesis. Um, so it is challenging to ask them to uh, make good UML mo models that are available. Uh, I know that one of the students is not working on finding automatic, automatic generation from the code base. Uh, because we know that this would help a lot. Um, but yeah, that would have been nice if um, we had better diagramming of the software base. Well, maybe a remark too. Uh, 25 hours learning Capella. Uh, can you brag that Dawn? Scott is uh, feeling slow. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, from what I understood, um, I think he spent like three hours doing the catapult catapult modeling and then 22 hours modeling the bootloader so that was actually and that's only one one function and there aren't that many model elements in that function um, we did not model it operationally because it's a bottom-up model and there was no point in doing that for the purpose at that time uh, so this is 25 hours spread out over maybe two months. So I wouldn't say it's full time. There's a lot of maturity going into this also. Yes, yes. And as precise on the chat, maybe the scope of learning isn't exactly the same. You know? <laughs> yeah. And uh, I think um, what I really would like is to get more students into this so that we could get more data. And that would also help us plan future work. Uh, next question. Uh, are you aware of the recently released Object Management Group's CubeSat system reference model profile for SizeML? Yes. Uh, I've been a part of the um, small or the satellite systems working group since 2018, that in COSI. So I, I'm aware of that CubeSat reference model. Uh, I wish uh, it were easily imported to Capella. If someone wants to do that, it would be cool. But um, I've used it a bit with other modeling tools. Was it easier for software engineers to review the logical architecture diagram, or do they prefer to review the code itself? Um, they thought it was relatively easy to review the logical architecture diagram, uh, especially because of the functional change. Uh, the functional change highlight where we want them to look at. <laughs> uh, so I think um, I think using the functionality works well. And it's it was also done a lot uh, virtually because of uh, Corona restrictions. And that also worked fine. So you mentioned uh, the student had no experience, both in system engineering and modeling. Uh, how did the lack of system engineering knowledge influence the work? Uh, in your opinion? I know it's not an easy question. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, first of all, um, I don't think it influenced the quality of the work for the goals we had. Uh, what it did, though, was influence how much time the student had to model, uh, because um, we had to really understand some of the basics with modeling and systems engineering understand traceability, what it means, what operational systems view, all of these things mean. And that takes time, and that takes valuable time out of the modeling effort. Uh, so yeah, I need to work together with the other team members to figure out the better way to crash course systems engineering uh, to our students until we have a master's program up and running. Have you also tried to model the control flow uh, in your functional chains to mirror the logic in the code? Uh, no, I have not tried that. Uh, it would be very interesting to learn more about that, though. So if someone, I don't know if I, I don't think I remember to include my email. Yeah. But uh, you have my email somewhere, or I'm on LinkedIn. And um, please reach out if you have any other ideas or things. Mm -hmm.